All right, welcome to Unit 3 on Collecting Data. In this video, we're going to tackle Topic 3.7, Inference and Experiments. There's kind of two big ideas in this topic that we're going to address. And the first one is statistical inference. Now, what does it mean to infer? Like if you're a detective, you take your clues, you put all those kind of clues together, and then you make a good educated guess, educated estimate based on all those clues. So statistical inference is basically the same thing. Um, statistical inference is the ability to take statistics from a sample and infer those results to the population parameter. So the whole idea is that we have this population mean, mu, that we don't know what it is. But what we do is we look at a sample. And from that sample, we get a sample mean, x bar. And as long as that sample mean is randomly selected, or as long as that sample is randomly selected from the population that we're interested in, then, you know, we should be able to use that sample statistic to infer what is true for the population. And the same thing could be true for proportions as well. We have this true proportion P from the population that we want to know. So we look at a clue. The clue is our sample proportion. And again, as long as that sample was selected from the population that we care about and it was selected randomly, we should be able to take the information we learned from that sample proportion and infer it to the population proportion. So that's the whole idea of statistical inference is using statistics from samples to make good educated guesses about population parameters. And the key is pretty simple. It needs to be selected randomly, the sample does, and it needs to be selected from the population that you care about. All right, now this idea, this concept, also applies to experiments. If you want to conclude that the results of an experiment are applicable to a larger population, simply put, the subjects must be randomly selected from that population. Now, this is great. This all makes sense, right? You know, if we got this group of people that we randomly selected and we put them through an experiment, at the end of the experiment, we learned that X causes Y. Well, then, hey, we should be able to say that X causes Y for all people in the population. The only issue with that is that typically in an experiment, we kind of have to use volunteers. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, we're giving them something, right? Like in an experiment, you make people do something. And if you just pick people randomly from the population, they might not want to do it, what you want. They might be like, eh, I don't really care about that. So um, sometimes, again, we do have to use volunteers in an experiment. It's not the end of the world, but it does limit our results. So if you do have to use volunteers in an experiment, any, any conclusions that you make can only be limited to those volunteers. So that's the only drawback with an experiment is we want to be able to take what we learned from an experiment and apply it to a larger population. But we could only do that if that sample was randomly selected, which, like I said, oftentimes is not the case. We use volunteers. So it does limit our conclusion capabilities, I guess, or who we could generalize that to. Um, now, the other thing that we really want to do when it comes to an experiment is we want to show that cause and effect relationship, right? I mean, you cannot do this in an observational study. It's impossible. There's way too many confounding variables. But if we truly do a good experiment, then we can actually attempt to show a cause and effect relationship. We want to show that an explanatory variable can actually cause a change in the response variable. Now, what allows for this, right, is the fact that we're doing random assignment of the subjects to the treatment groups. And that is one of the most important aspects of an experiment, is that who gets what is completely random. There is assignment. They don't pick. The subjects don't pick. You don't pick. It's got to be up to randomness. And as long as you have that, you can show causation. See, observational studies, all you do is observe. All you do is watch. Maybe you ask questions, but you don't impose anything. It's not an experiment. So an observational study, you could show relationships. You could show strong associations, but you just can't say that X causes Y if it's observational. So at the end of the day, think of it this way. The perfect experiment is one that will randomly select subjects from the population of interest and then randomly assign those subjects to the different treatment groups. So there's actually two aspects of randomness here. The subjects that we get to be involved in the experiment were randomly selected from the population and who gets what within the experiment is randomly assigned. So thus, if this is true, we can officially say that the explanatory variable will cause a change in the response variable for all people in the population. 
So imagine if our population is people with, with massive headaches, right? And we have this new pill that we think is going to work. So we go and select, you know, 100 random people that have massive headaches from the population of all people that have massive headaches. And we randomly assign 50 of them to the pill, 50 of them to a placebo pill. And at the end, the people that took the real pill showed less headaches. Okay, well, because I had random assignment within, I could say that the new pill caused a reduction in headaches. And because I selected my subjects randomly from the population of all people who have headaches, then I can officially say my new pill will help you reduce your headaches if you have massive headaches, right? I can apply it to everybody. But again, that's in a perfect experiment. And like I've already said, typically we do have to use volunteers because I can't pick somebody from the population and make them take a new pill. So in most cases, we do have to use volunteers. And I mean, it's okay. I could still show cause and effect as long as I have my random assignment, but I could only say that the results will affect people who are volunteers. I can only say that what I have learned is true for these volunteers. I cannot generalize my findings to the greater population if I'm using volunteers. So in a perfect experiment, if you do have that random selection, then you can generalize to all people, but not if you use volunteers. So you got to understand when can you infer, when can you use that word cause and effect, and who you can infer your results to. It's all tied together. All right, but, but honestly, be careful, right? Th this is serious, and this is true in the real world. Even the best experiments with great results still is sometimes hard for researchers to say that the explanatory variable causes a change in the response because even if you do this great experiment, there's still a chance for all kinds of confounding variables. So sometimes more trials are needed and more experiments are needed. Um, if you actually want to show you know, that, that X causes Y, maybe you need to do five or six experiments all around the world with different groups of people to really prove it. Because if you could show that something works for multiple, multiple experiments, then I think you have a good case that maybe X does cause Y, okay? Um, and at the end of the day, maybe all you can conclude is that there's a strong association. You just can't use that word causation if not everything is absolutely perfect. All right. Now let's dive into the second part of this um, idea in this video. And it's, let's consider the results of an experiment, okay? Now this whole unit has been on planning an experiment, not actually conducting one. But at the end of an experiment, you're always going to have data to look at. And remember, you have to have at least two treatment groups. So you have to have at least two groups to actually compare. So here's a couple of examples, right? Um, let's just say that we have 300 people 150 of them are going to wear a nicotine patch for six months. 150 of them are going to wear a fake placebo patch for six months. And at the end, I'm going to ask them, who quit smoking? How many of you quit smoking? So for the people that wore the nicotine patch, 124 out of the 150 quit smoking. That's 82.67%. Of the people that were using the placebo patch, 65 quit smoking. That's 43.33%. So the question now is, okay, I got these results. Okay. Is this a significant difference? Does this difference prove that the nicotine patch will ha give you a much greater chance to quit smoking? Well, that's a really tough question, right? You know, it's not just as simple as looking at those numbers and be like, whoop, 82 is bigger than 43. Yep, I've done it. Well, no, it's very complicated and it's much more statistical. Here's another example. So I got a bunch of teachers, right? And um, I'm going to tell some of the teachers to go to a professional development to help them increase their math knowledge. And the other group of teachers are not going to attend the professional development to help increase their math knowledge. But at the end, after a week, everybody takes a math test. And the average score for the people who attended the professional development was 77.62. And the average score for the people that did not was 31.56. That's a big difference, right? But is it a statistically significant difference? It's not just as simple as 77 is bigger than 31. Yep, go to the conference. You're going to get smarter. No, it's, it's a lot more than that, right? We have to actually determine what does statistically significant mean and how could I prove it? So that's the idea here, right? Now that we got the numbers, now that we got the statistics at the end of the experiment, it's the job of the statisticians hired by the researchers to determine if the difference between the statistics is officially statistically significant or not. And if you love this class, if this is something that's interesting to you, 
then go into college and major in statistics because you can get paid a lot of money to do this, to answer this question. It's not as simple as you think. And it actually involves being able to understand two things. A, what the heck does statistically significant mean? Like, you really need to understand the definition of that. And B, how the heck are you going to determine this? You know, if I look back at 82% versus 43%, you know, first off, if I'm going to say that 82 is statistically significant bigger than 43, I better know what statistically significant means. And B, if I'm going to say that, I need to prove it. And that's where the math comes in. All right, so what does statistically significant mean? Well, it means that if the difference between two or more statistics are deemed statistically significant, it means the difference between the statistics was too large that it would have been very unlikely to have occurred by chance. That's pretty big. Most kids will say maybe that's simple to remember, but it's really important that you understand. If we say that the difference between two statistics is statistically significant, what we're saying is that the difference was so large, it would have been very unlikely to have occurred by chance. And there's no set number, right? Some kids will say, well, if it's 10% or bigger, does that mean it's significant? No. Like I've actually seen um, experiments where there was a 40% difference and it was not statistically significant. And I've also seen experiments where there was a 1% difference and it was statistically significant. So, I mean, it does come down to understanding the math, which we are going to learn about later on in this course. but you need to simply right now understand what that means. And it all comes down to this idea. When we're at the end of an experiment, when we look at two sets of subjects, there's two possibilities. Number one, the difference we are seeing is simply occurring by chance. Like maybe any two different samples are just bound to be different, right? Like maybe I'm seeing 82 and 43, just because they were different samples. Like if I were to repeat this experiment, I might see the placebo group be at 82% and the patch group be at 43%. Like maybe the difference I'm seeing is just due to pure chance. Like, I mean, come on. If you have two samples, you're naturally gonna have a difference for the pure fact that you have different people in the two samples. They're never gonna be exactly the same. So that's one option, or maybe the second option is that the difference is so large that it must be due to the explanatory variable, directly causing the response variable to change. So basically we're saying that there's little chance it was by chance, right? So those are the two outcomes. When you end an experiment and you have your two statistics, you have to ask yourself, why is one group at 77 and one group at 31? Is it because they're just two different groups? It just happened pure by happenstance? Or is it because attending the professional development truly makes the math teachers know more math? You got to answer that question, right? But you need to understand that there are two legitimate possibilities for why these numbers are different. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you here. Now, the second question is, all right, now that we understand what statistically significant means, how do we determine it? Well, believe it or not, it's not as easy as you may think. It involves quite a bit of tough statistical thought and calculations, all of which we are going to learn later on in this course. In a nutshell, we will need to find the difference between our statistics and then determine the probability of that difference occurring. So if we go back to our math here, right? If we go back to our math example here at the bottom with our average scores, you know, 77 minus 31, that's about a 46 point difference, right? Give or take with the decimals. So now that we see that there's a 46 point difference, our job as statisticians is to determine what's the probability of a difference that big? What's the probability of that happen? Is it unlikely or is it very likely? If it's very likely, well then you know what? These are probably two just random samples. What are you gonna do? But if the difference of 46 is very, very unlikely, but it happened, that's when we could actually say that there is a statistically significant difference between these numbers. And being able to find that probability is very difficult. Well, I'll say this. Once we learn it later on in the course, I hope you'll find it's easy. But getting there is going to be a rough, bumpy ride. But for now, honestly, just for now, just understand that the results being deemed statistically significant means that the difference was too big 
to have occurred by chance or that the difference found would have been very unlikely to have occurred by chance, right? Either way, all we're trying to say is that I need you right now to simply understand what the term statistically significant means. It means that the difference in our two treatments, the difference in our two statistics was too large that it would have been unlikely to have happened by chance. We'll learn all the more details later on, but just know that it's not quite that simple. And actually, I can't wait to teach it to you. I'm super excited, but you need to have the base, the foundation of what statistically significant means. All right, guys, short video, not a ton of slides here, but a lot of, a lot of good information, a lot of good depth. So if you need to rewatch, if you need to rewind to try to hear something again, definitely do it. But other than that, I'll see you in the next video.